This is nice. Take a deep breath of that newly oxygenized air. And listen to the wind blow through those newly evolved trees. Just remember to keep an eye on the water's edge. Welcome to the Backpacker's Guide to Prehistory. Hello and welcome to the Backpacker's Guide to Prehistory, the podcast that provides top travel tips for time travellers. I'm your tour guide, David Mountain. In this episode, we're travelling all the way back to the Devonian, a chunk of Earth's history lasting from 419 to 359 million years ago. I really like it here in the Devonian. There's a sense that life forms, both plants and animals, are really stepping up a gear. The oceans and rivers teem with life, and fish have undergone massive diversification. On land, we see vertebrates take their first steps out of the water, and, perhaps most significantly of all, we see the spread of land plants and the evolution of the first forests. Indeed, the Devonian is the first time in our planet's history when you can enjoy a really exciting holiday on land. Which might be for the best, as there are some pretty fearsome jaws lurking beneath the waves. I can't wait to explore the Devonian, and to guide me through this fascinating world, I've recruited the help of two experts. Dr Sandy Hetherington, a paleobotanist at the University of Edinburgh. Hi there! And Dr Alice Clement, a paleontologist at Flinders University. Hello! Before we go any further, however, we need to get some travel necessities out the way. As a general rule of time travel, the further back in time you go, the more planning you need to do. And the Devonian, being situated in the middle of the Paleozoic, is the oldest time period we've yet explored on this podcast. So let's get some essential travel preparation sorted. First of all, time. 400 million years ago, the Earth was spinning on its axis considerably faster than today. As a result, time is a little different to what we're used to. Devonian days were only 22 hours long, and there were about 400 days in a Devonian year. So, and there's really no way around this, you are going to get what's effectively jet lag on your holiday, and it will get progressively worse every day you stay there. Sadly, the only way to cure this prehistoric jet lag is to come back to the present day. Humans are hardwired for 24-hour days, and our bodies simply don't cope very well with anything else. That's why holidaymakers, and you may have noticed this, that's why holidaymakers returning from the Paleozoic always look so tired. Moving on to the second essential bit of holiday prep, breathing. Most of us take this for granted here in the Holocene, but backpackers need to be aware that the atmosphere is undergoing major changes during the Devonian. At the start of the period, carbon dioxide levels are about five times higher than today, making up about 0.2% of the atmosphere. Oxygen levels in the Devonian, meanwhile, drop to around 13% by the middle of the period. Compare that to today's 21%. So if you do want to visit the early or the middle Devonian, you're going to need to bring your own supply of oxygen, Otherwise, well, jet lag will be the least of your worries. By the late Devonian, however, things have changed dramatically. Carbon dioxide levels have halved to just 0.1% of the atmosphere. That's just two and a half times today's levels. And oxygen levels, meanwhile, have risen to today's 21%, and they might have even been a little bit higher. All this means that, for the first time in our planet's history, it's safe to breathe the air. One possible contributing factor to this changing atmosphere is the rise of land plants, perhaps the single most significant feature of the Devonian. But if you're planning a trip to the early Devonian, about 400 million years ago, don't expect to find vast stretches of greenery or huge trees. 
because at this point in time, plants are still in the early stages of their colonization of the land. But they were there. Sandy, what types of plants can you expect to find in the early Devonian? Yeah, so if you're standing in the early Devonian, it's going to look pretty different to what you're used to today. So the first thing that's going to strike you is there's going to be lots of plants, but most of the features you think about plants, like leaves and roots and wood and trees, they're not there. The plants that you're looking at are really these tiny little uh, moss-like species, which have little stems that are like axes, so no, no leaves. You say they're moss-like, so how tall could they grow? In the early Devonian, at the most, we're talking about sort of 20, 30 centimetres, but typically spreading across the surface rather than shooting upwards. These early land plants are remarkable, but if they're not quite your bag, then maybe consider visiting the late Devonian, say 370 million years ago, because you're going to be greeted by a very different scene. Sandy, what plants were growing by this point in time? Yeah, there's been this enormous transition. So lots of these early plants, these plants like the very earliest kind of ferns and club mosses, um, they've kind of diversified. And what we're seeing in the late Devonian are the first forests. So I think we'd all be able to recognise, you know, tall trees, 10, 20 metres high, and there'd be a whole range of different plants in the, in the late Devonian. We have things that look quite fern-like. We have other things that have kind of wooden bark, which we'd associate today with living conifer trees. So plants that look quite similar to conifers. And they're actually, lots of them are part of a group known as the pro ferns. So these are the ancestors of the gymnosperms. And gymnosperms today produce seeds. And these are plants like conifers today. So there would have been a few of these giant trees like Archaeopteris, which are growing up towards the sky. But actually, if you were looking along the ground, that might be where you'd actually find the relatives of living seed plants today. Because in the very late Devonian, this is the time, where, the earliest time we're starting to find plants with true seeds. But they weren't actually the giant trees at that point. They were just um, smaller scrambling plants. That's interesting because when I'm in the Devonian, I would like you say, you can recognise, well, that's a tree, that's undergrowth. But when I look a bit closer, I really don't recognise, well, any of the species. There's some things that look like ferns, some things that look like horsetails. But the big trees, the real dominant plants, they're completely unknown to me. It's a fascinating time when you, if you were, you know, standing in one of these forests, you'd be looking at a range of trees that would all look slightly similar. You know, you'd know there were trees, but actually, as you said, when you look closer in a bit more detail, they all look quite unusual. So the kind of growth habit of the trees varies. So as I said, these ones, the pro gymnosperms, these are making these large woody type tree trunks that look kind of similar to conifers today. However, if you look up at their leaves, their leaves are looking far more fern-like and there's no seeds. There's actually just in these spore producing structures. So that's the first thing that's kind of strange. And then there's a couple of other plants around the place which also look quite unusual. So these are things that are relatives of ferns today or the club mosses. And they are also these kind of tree type plants, but they look probably more like a palm tree. So like a kind of swollen base and then these kind of scaly trunks leading up to a kind of um, an array of branches at the top. So again, yeah, really quite different. Yeah. And club mosses today, they're obviously not filling these niches anymore. No, definitely not. So the relatives that we're familiar with today are very different plants. Oh, c completely different, completely different. So yeah, if, if you think about club mosses today, if you've ever been walking up in the highlands of Scotland or in many kind of forested ecosystems, you find club mosses kind of scrambling around on the, on the ground, really. And there's a couple of club mosses today that are in trees, but they're actually epiphytes. So they're living off other trees and growing in the canopy. But by the end of the Devonian, we're beginning to get the first of these tree club mosses. So... The, the relatives of these the club mosses today, they had evolved wood and they were capable of growing to these colossal sizes. I think if you were looking for plants that are most similar, if you're back in the early Devonian again, at that point in the early Devonian, there'd be some things that do look very similar to those living club mosses you would find today, especially alpine type club mosses. By the late Devonian, you, you've got the origins of this amazing lineage, which are now completely extinct, these giant tree-like lycophytes. So in the Devonian, in the space of just a few tens of millions of years, there's a revolution in land plants. They go from the small moss-like plants of the early Devonian that you were talking about to huge trees and entire forests. And I'm really intrigued to find out what adaptations plants acquired that allowed them to achieve this revolution. 
So it's a really remarkable time for a kind of explosion in plant diversity. And again, if we're standing there in the late Devonian, we're surrounded by this forest. I think there's kind of three key innovations that I draw your attention to, which has really helped this explosion. The first is actually under our feet. And it's what you can't see under this forest are giant woody rooting systems extending down into the substrate up to a couple of meters underground. So the earliest plants in the early Devonian, you really find almost no rooting systems present. And so during the Devonian, there's an explosion in the diversity of the types of rooting systems, their depth, their size, and this allowed plants to access water, nutrients, and also to start producing the soils we're so much more familiar with today. So that's going on below our feet. If we look up to the sky now, we'll see leaves. That's the other big innovation that's happened. So obviously leaves are kind of ubiquitous in, in plants today. And we're looking up to the sky in the late Devonian and lots of the plants have leaf-like axes. So when I'm talking about leaves, obviously we're all familiar with these kind of planar flat surfaces, really great for capturing sunlight. But again, back in the early Devonian, these were just not present. There's only a couple of very small lineages, a couple of these very early club mosses that had leaves. So in the Devonian, Roots are evolving below ground, leaves are evolving above ground, and this is just leading to an explosion in diversity. But I think the third and most important one of these innovations for this innovation in size has got to be wood. So wood really is the building block of trees today, and I think we really take it for granted that actually wood didn't just have a single origin, it has actually evolved independently in the Devonian in multiple lineages. So when you're in that Devonian forest, you're looking at early relatives of sea plants, early relatives of ferns, and early relatives of these club mosses. All of them have independently evolved wood around the same time, enabling them to produce these tree-like structures. That's amazing. I had no idea. I just assumed wood was wood and that it had a single evolutionary origin. I suppose it shows that there was strong selection pressure to grow taller and stronger than your competitors in order to reach the sunlight. Definitely, as you said, the, the kind of race for the sky, really. But there's also been quite an interesting hypothesis that it wasn't just necessarily a race to the sky, but also it's a race to produce larger woody roots. So in actual fact, the same advantage of having wood that allows you to grow tall and compete with other plants on the surface also enables you to have these rooting systems that can go down to a few meters in depth and access deep water and deep nutrients. So you mentioned roots and soil. Am I right in thinking that soil didn't really exist before the Devonian, before these plants spread onto land? Yeah, so it's, it's a really interesting case trying to like picture what the terrestrial surface must have looked like before the Devonian, because obviously there was life on land. You know, there's a, there's a diversity of fungi, of algae. And so there would have been structures that we call today cryptogamic covers. So this is a kind of saying we would use for that kind of very, very thin layer of life you often get covering rocks and boulder fields today. So I think there would have been that element, but there weren't deep soils in the same way. There weren't these organic rich soils that we're so familiar with. However, these are really, again, exploding in diversity in the Devonian. So soils are getting deeper, plants are breaking up rock, but also lots of that plant tissue is getting buried within soils and we're getting the first peats, so soils rich in carbon, um, and also just preserving a lot of that organic material, which, as you know, is also a great home for fungi, microbes, and animal life as well. Amazing. I, I think we should be clear, just because plants have colonised the lands during the Devonian, they haven't colonised all the land. They're still quite restricted in where they can grow. Yeah, I mean, it's always a difficult question to, to really know how much is down to preservation bias about where the plants are. But we do predict that, especially these early plants in the early Devonian, were really reliant on water. And it's only as we get later to these tree light habits where you can actually have these deeper rooting systems that allow you to access water throughout the year. So our prediction is that early land plants were growing in, in close proximity to water, so around pools, rivers. But these also come with problems as well, because if you grow too close to a river and the river often floods, you have a chance of being buried. So I think there are selection pressures that would enable plants to move out of that very turbulent environment out into these more stable settings. But the downside is there you do need to have these deeper rooting systems and, and ways of accessing water throughout the year. Because in the Devonian, it was quite a dry time, wasn't it? That's completely true. And actually, one of the reasons for that is that plants play such a key role in actually recirculating water. So what plants do is they really, if you can imagine a large tree is just like sticking a large straw in the ground, it's actually taking up water with its roots and then it's transpiring it out through its leaves. 
And actually, this has a major influence on hydrological cycles. So there's a, a great paper by Kevin Boyce saying that flowering plant trees put rain in the rainforest because they were actually taking up and recycling so much more water. So in the Devonian, again, this is all just beginning to kick in. You know, the evolution of trees is meaning that there's more water being cycled at this time. And again, this is starting from these very small plants. So definitely, I think plants had a key role in, in changing these hydrological systems. Oh, absolutely. This is what I find so fascinating. With the evolution of land plants, you get soils, you get more water, you get complete change in how the earth really works. It's just such a threshold moment in the history of life, I think. Definitely. I really, I really think that, you know, plants in this sense really are ecosystem engineers. They're, they're transforming the terrestrial surface and then they're products of their own evolution. Because as soon as you get an innovation like um, wood, the plants are getting taller and they're changing the ecosystem more, which is enabling entire new layers of plants from the kind of lower ecosystem at the base, you know, what you call like a forest floor. And then you've got the larger trees as well. One thing I've been meaning to ask you, the, the last time I was in the Devonian, I saw these kind of, well, I don't really know what I saw. There were these massive columns, kind of leafless, branchless, growing out the ground. They were much taller than me and a lot of the other plants. I don't suppose you'd know what they were. These are the mysterious prototaxites. So they, at their time, were the largest organisms on the, on the terrestrial surface. And when we found the, you know, the fossil relics of these giant organisms, they were an absolute mystery as to what these things were, as you find them early on in the Devonian period. So when they were first found, people thought they must be giant woody trees. Then they thought whether they were actually potentially aquatic, could they be giant algal mats? But we now have a, a much better understanding and they've been agreed that they're likely the spore producing members of giant fungi. So actually, Protosexites has been assigned to a group of, of fungi, so they're almost like giant mushrooms, but their they're kind of closest living relatives today might be things closer to things like brewer's yeast and truffles. So yeah, a really remarkable structure that, you, as you said, could grow to a number of metres in height. They must have been really remarkable. It's absolutely bizarre. So you've got these truffle relatives growing over the plants. It's really just so different from today. Definitely is. Must have been, yeah. Really, really remarkable time. Absolutely. As you might have guessed, exploring these Devonian forests can be a strange experience for us. But not only because they're full of unfamiliar plants and fungi, but because they're so quiet. There really aren't that many land animals around at this point. The sky above me is largely empty. There aren't many flying insects yet, and certainly nothing like birds so there's no dawn chorus in the morning. That's not to say that there aren't any animals though. If I were to search in the undergrowth, I'd probably find some terrestrial arthropods, such as millipedes, scorpions, and some early arachnids that look a little bit like tiny spiders. And if you're setting up camp close to a swamp or a river, do watch out for your ripterids, also known as sea scorpions, although they inhabited freshwater as well. By the Devonian, there are some real monsters out there, Animals such as Hippotopterus, a chunky eryptorid that can grow up to two meters long and, worst of all, can haul itself out of the water and walk around on land. So do make sure that you zip up your tent at night, because you really don't want to wake up to find one of these things trying to crawl into your sleeping bag. But I think the most exciting and certainly less terrifying land animals of the Devonian are the tetrapods. Alice. When we're talking about the Devonian, what are tetrapods? Well, I guess the best place to start is to think about tetrapods today. Uh, so tetrapods account for about half of all vertebrate diversity, vertebrates being animals with backbones, of course. And so the word tetrapod encapsulates all amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals. So that's relatively clear cut. But of course, when we look back through the fossil record, the early tetrapods, the cutoff between what is a fish, what is a tetrapod becomes less clear. But during the Devonian, we do see the appearance of the earliest tetrapods. And these are classified as having four limbs bearing digits, so with fingers and toes. During the Devonian, we see a number of these tetrapods beginning to spend time on land, if only for short periods. This is obviously a massive evolutionary achievement. So what adaptations did Devonian tetrapods have that enabled them to spend time out of the water? 
One of the most obvious ones, of course, is probably to have limbs to support your body weight out of the water rather than fins to swim around in the water. And so you have to have a strengthening of the girdle attaching your limbs to the body, the pectoral and pelvic girdles. You probably need a strengthening of the, the axial skeleton, your vertebrae, for example, but you need a more complex internal skeleton inside your fins. And so it's within this group that we do see a sort of gradual increase in complexity of the internal bones. And they are essentially the same bones. Well, they are exactly the same bones that we have in our own arms and legs. So they have a femur and a humerus in their upper and lower limbs, just as we do. Another important thing for tetrapods to move onto land and to thrive onto land is to be able to obtain oxygen from the air. Fish, of course, have gills and they obtain most of their oxygen from the water this way. But tetrapods would have had to start evolving adaptations to be able to access that atmospheric oxygen instead. When I'm in the Devonian and I want to see one of these animals, whereabouts should I be looking? What habitats do they prefer? I think the best place would be sort of near shore environments. So you might find them in estuary or what is often described as marginal marine. So you wouldn't go deep into the ocean and you wouldn't go fully onto land because, of course, we actually think that the earliest tetrapods were probably still aquatic. So even though that they'd grown limbs and digits, there's clues from their skeletons showing that they wouldn't have had the strength to hold their body out of the water yet in the earliest members, nor would they have had the joint mobility and flexibility to be able to move adequately on land. So nearshore environments would have been best. That's got me thinking because the last time I was on a Devonian shoreline, I found, well, I think I found what looked like a seven-toed footprint in the mud. That can't be right, can it? No, that's right. That's something really cool about early tetrapods. So the earliest forms you can think of taxa such as Acanthostega, Ichthyostega, Tulipaton maybe, and they had variable numbers of digits. So they varied between six, seven, sometimes eight digits, and sometimes the number of digits could differ from the front to the back feet. And it's not until we get to the earliest, what we consider to be the truly terrestrial tetrapods, which actually appeared, we think, in the early Carboniferous, that we seem to settle on this five-digit pattern, which has then, of course, been kept for much of evolution and including into our own hands and feet. And so I think it must have been something about the asymmetry of five that worked really well for moving around on land rather than acting as a paddle in water where you could have extra digits. That's interesting. Because mm. I've always wondered... Why was it five that was eventually settled on Exactly, this? yeah, yeah. I think we should point out at this point that these tetrapods weren't exactly tadpoles. I mean, some of them could grow up to a metre and a half long, and a lot of them seem to have quite sharp teeth. So I'm just wondering, <laughs> do they pose a danger to holidaymakers if, say, you got too close to one? Yeah, I think if you saw one on holiday, you wouldn't go chasing after it, but they definitely weren't the most dangerous beasts around at the time. There were some other fish that were a lot more frightening. Well, it's interesting that you say that because I did want to ask you about fish as well. I mean, this is the Devonian, it's the age of fishes. So can you give an overview of the types of fish that you might find in the Devonian? The Devonian was a wonderful time. We see uh, the appearance and radiation and evolution of so many different groups of fish. Uh, of course, there's jawless fishes. So there's some weird and wonderful fish that have external bony plates. And there's other smaller jawless fish, but the fish of the day, I suppose, were the placoderms. And most of the placoderms were also heavily armoured, so large bony plates covering at least the forepart of their bodies. And they were very diverse and very successful, and very widespread. And they did range from being relatively small taxa to some really, really large beasts as well. In fact, the largest fish that existed during the Devonian was one of these giant placoderms called Dunkelosteus. Well, it's interesting you mentioned Dunkelosteus because I did want to ask specifically about this thing because it's I think it combines the least threatening name with the most threatening face in all nature. So how big exactly was this fish? Yeah, Dunkelosteus was huge. I'm not sure that we've got its entire body preserved, but just looking at its jaw and skull is frightening enough. Uh, I think estimates take it to about, it might have been up to nine or ten metres in length perhaps, but it had huge jaws and it didn't have 
teeth uh, as we do, but it had sharp blades in its mouth for slicing up its prey. And it's definitely not something I would have liked to be swimming around with. But there were also other very large lobefin fish that were large predators. A lobefin fish called rhizodonts or megalichthyids could also grow up to some six or so metres and had really large fangs and also looked pretty terrifying. So you're not safe in the freshwater environment either. Is there anywhere that I can really go swimming in the Devonian? Because it's pretty hot and you get a lot of people who want to just take a dip and cool off. But is there anywhere you can do that without being eaten? Yeah, you might think it would be a nice beach holiday destination, but yeah, I mean, you could have a swim, but I think you should take your own shark cage for protection. <laughs> okay. That's the kind of practical advice we're looking for. That's good. <laughs> Sadly, as so often seems to be the case in prehistory, the late Devonian is shaped by a significant extinction event, a mass extinction. What was going on in the late Devonian? So the late Devonian is marked by a period of extreme change, and we have record of that in the geological record. Of course, the causes of this change is somewhat unclear, but we do know that there's, for example, a huge amount of anoxia, so a low oxygen events spreading through the oceans, and that would have caused the extinction of many marine organisms. We also know that there's a lot of cooling, probably increased glaciation and related sea level falls and whatnot. A lot of factors have been have been put forward for the late Devonian mass extinction. And one that I particularly find interesting is that actually plants were one of the major causes. And the reason for that is that they predict that actually these the enormous changes that plants are making to the terrestrial surface, especially changing things like nutrient fluxes and carbon burial, is actually leading to some of the major impacts such as ocean anoxia. And they're doing that because they're changing this nutrient cycling, changing the amount of runoff that goes into the oceans. So in actual fact, you know, one of the hypotheses put forward is that plants played a key role in perturbing the Earth's system and therefore leading to the end of Onian mass extinction. So the end of Onian is actually marked by two different extinction events. So one is called the Kelvassa and then another is called the Hangenberg event. But together, the end of Onian is one of the big five major extinctions. So there's some close to 75% of life is lost, which really changed the face of life on Earth. But it did pave the way for other groups to then expand and radiate throughout the Carboniferous and onwards. So 75%, that's enormous. How did that affect the fish that we've been talking about just a minute ago, the placoderms and the jawless fish and the lobefin fish? How did they fare? Yeah, so there's a huge impact on the fish. All the placoderms disappear, all the strange armoured jawless fish have disappeared. Many of the lobefin fish disappeared. So when I say lobefin fish, today we have lungfish and coelacanth, but during the Devonian they were much more diverse as well and they had many different groups. And most of those groups also went extinct at the end of the Devonian. And fish that are very successful today, such as the rayfin fish, only had a very small number of species and they tended to be very small individuals during the Devonian. But as I mentioned, with a large extinction event, it cleared the way for groups like that that did manage to hold on to then radiate into the huge diversity we have today. It is often the small ones, isn't it, that manage to slip through these events? Yeah, there's something about it. And then on land with these, these early tetrapods, do we know how they fared as well? Well, tetrapods were only just getting going during the Devonian, so we only know of some perhaps 15 or so species that have been described from the Devonian, so they were still quite rare. But again, it's, it's once they fully get onto land and foray into that terrestrial realm that they really radiate and find their success. Sandy, you mentioned just now that plants might have contributed to the late Devonian mass extinction. But did they suffer at all? How did those first forests cope at the end of this period? This is something that people have been investigating for some time. And what's always quite striking about mass extinction events is plants don't necessarily follow the exact same trends as animals. So you don't, when you look at the diversity record of plants, you don't see the mass extinction events punctuating the evolution in quite the same extent as you do in animal evolution. So the end of only a mass extinction, you definitely see extinction in a number of plant groups, such as some of the early relatives of club mosses, a group called the zoosophiles. So there are plants going extinct, but there's also, this is an actual real time of plant innovation. So there's also a lot of diversification of plants, especially in the relatives of 
ferns and and sea plants and also in the lycophytes as well so this definitely was a time of major extinction and turnover but there wasn't this absolute enormous sweep and extinction of many of the you know many of the major groups so plants really emerge from the late devonian as survivors as the champions of the land Definitely, definitely. I think, you know, there are obviously a, a number of the lineages that go extinct, but it, in general, they're, they're ready to explode into this kind of diverse carboniferous world, really. Alice, with all the anoxia and the cooling, is it actually worth someone visiting the end of the Devonian? Is it dangerous for humans, do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, oxygen levels were really low from the mid-Devonian onwards, so that would make things tough, of course. You'd have to take your own oxygen supply. But we do think that this oxygen dip in the middle Devonian was probably responsible for a lot of the, it may have been one of the driving factors for the appearance of tetrapods, you know, fish that were adapting or evolving adaptations to be able to supplement oxygen from the air as well as water. And we see something parallel happening in the lungfish at the time as well. They're developing different adaptations in their skeleton to support atmospheric oxygen in addition to getting oxygen from the water. Is that that gulping motion you see fish do sometimes? Yeah, so lungfish in particular, and lungfish are very dear to my heart, they are known for being able to come to the surface and gulp oxygen and take it into a lung. But we do see in the early tetrapods or the tetrapod-like fishes, we see an appearance of there's a special hole or gap on the top of the skull called a spiracular notch which is an opening that actually feeds directly into the mouth cavity. And so, the, so these fish could come to the surface and actually taking oxygen through the tops of their skulls. Wow. It's very weird. <laughs> but today, Polypterus is a fish that actually supplements its oxygen in the same way, can take in air from the top of its skull. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And you make a very good point that extinction isn't just the end of things, but that it paves the way for new forms of life. And so... Rather than get too focused on death in the Devonian, let's not forget the incredible life that this period was home to. And on that note, I'd like to end by asking each of my guests for their one must-see Devonian experience. Well, for me, it would have to be to find and watch the first tetrapod that actually walked out onto land, because there's much debate about exactly where it happened, when it happened, and I also want to know why it happened. Was it chasing a tasty bug or was it running away from something bigger than it or some other reason? So I can't tell you exactly when or where that happened because we're still working to figure it out. But that's something I would love to see. And for you, Sandy? So for me, it has to be the Rhinicher geothermal ecosystem. So again, I'm picturing being in the Devonian. I've had a nice long walk around the foothills of the Caledonian Mountains. And in the distance, you can see these geysers erupting. Just looks like a fantastic place to go. So after this long day, how about having an unwind in this geothermal ecosystem? Have a little swim in the nice kind of warm geothermal pools. You're surrounded by a diversity of early plants and animal life, watching the geysers erupt with the mountains in the background. So I think for me, that's where I'd be. Early Devonian in Scotland, really, in in the Rhiney ecosystem. That sounds really quite good, quite relaxing actually, which is a welcome change for this show. So I like that recommendation. And all that's left for me to say is thank you very much to my two guests, Dr. Sandy Hetherington and Dr. Alice Clement for sharing their Devonian travel tips. If you've enjoyed what we've been talking about today, then do check out their work because they're exploring really fascinating areas of the story of life on Earth. There are links to their research in the episode notes. And most of all, thank you to you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. And if you have, please feel free to like, subscribe, share, and leave a positive review. And I hope you'll join us again for another episode of the Backpacker's Guide to Prehistory. But until then, safe travels. Thank you.